So, I know I said I probably wouldn't um, do any more of these, but I had a request. So, by popular demand, I guess I'm back for another little chat. I was speaking to um, a woman who used to be a ballerina with the New York City Ballet the other day, and she uh, danced for Balanchine, and he gave her rather some choice principal roles, and then he, unfortunately he died, and she stayed with the company, and she danced for a few more years under Peter Martin's direction, and worked a lot with Jerry Robbins, so she is very knowledgeable, and she's still very involved on a very high level in the ballet scene in New York. And she suggested very strongly that I continue these chats. Um, <laughs> I was flattered. She said people were watching them, that I had valuable information uh, to share, um, especially since my time with Balanchine was when he was a bit younger, when he was in his 60s, um, all the way to the end really, but mostly in his mid to late 60s and early 70s is when I was with him the most. So I wasn't really around that much in his latter years when he became ill, although I did visit him at the hospital and um, I did dance for him as a guest artist a couple years before he died. I did Oberon in The Midsummer Night's Dream, my old role. Everybody else was out, so <laughs> he called me to come do it again, so I did. Um, but also I've been advised by some other people that are in publishing not to give out too much information because it might hurt the sales of my book. You know, I don't want to give away uh, the milk, you know the saying. Why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free, that one, old saying. So I won't in my chats go into things that I go into in great detail in my book, like I won't go into Let's see, when Suzanne Farrell resigned, um, I happened to be in the office, the general manager, Betty Cage's office, when uh, Suzanne resigned, and it was quite a wild day because it was the day of the premiere of Dances at a Gathering, which was Jerome Robbins' big comeback to the New York City Ballet. And I happened to be in the manager's office because I also had a premiere of my own, uh, my Bernstein Ballet to uh, Prelude, Fugue, and Riffs that I was dancing in. And Allegra Kent and I were also in Dances and Gathering. So I was an eyewitness when everybody came running into the office one by one. Suzanne resigning, Balanchine coming in, Robbins coming in. So I won't go into any more details here. You have to read my book. Um, I won't talk about Peter Martin's first seven turbulent years in the company. This is no secret. He talks about it himself in his book. Um, although it's he had a tendency to whitewash a lot of what was going on, but I do talk about it. I don't dump on Peter. I mean, I really don't. I'm not doing a tell-all book, but I do think the record should be set straight in many areas. You know, I won't talk about Gelsey's first career and how she started on drugs and how spectacular she was when she was 16 and 17. She was phenomenal. She danced. I did a couple ballets for her, and she was one of my most regular partners. No. What I'm going to concentrate on here is um, Balanchine's, I'll put it in quotes, legacy. Uh, because Balanchine had a very uh, interesting, unique relationship to a legacy. Um, on one hand, uh, he didn't believe there would be any for his ballets. He said, oh, someday they'll be old-fashioned, nobody will like my ballets in the future. Um, People will think they're banal, etc., etc. Of course, I would argue with that because I always loved his ballets. But then um, he even uh, had a video once, an interview, where he said that he didn't really didn't care at all about his val ballets surviving. That he wanted to take them with him, basically, because he only did them so he could see them and see the dancers he was working with. And he said, "I'm very greedy. I don't even care if anybody else ever sees them." That was one side of it. However, he also had another flip side about all this, the future. You know, he was an existentialist, so he always would say, now is all there is. You can't control the future, so why even bother about it? And given his background, a young teenager during the Russian Revolution, losing one lung, which caused him to lose directorship of the Paris Opera when he was in his late 20s, um, he, more than anyone, knew the impermanence of life and that... Uh, Ballets, especially since they're danced by living beings, there's no way to preserve them in a way. 
that was his kind of negative. I think it was more of an acceptance than he really believed it. But the flip side was that he wanted his ballets preserved because he took such great care in filming them. And I was involved with the Berlin films where all the directors edited and did choppy camera angles, I mean choppy edits and bad camera angles and bad lighting and Balanchine had no contractual control and he was very upset about it and we had coffee one morning in the canteen and he was really depressed because he was almost crying because none of the ballets looked like his ballets. Only Symphony in C came out okay. That was the last couple of days the director just basically shot it from the front so he could really and full bodies and not a lot of editing of feet and legs and face. You know. So you could really get an idea of what the ballet looked like and so that was good. A couple other things were okay but most of them like 18 ballets were destroyed. So when it came time to dance in America on PBS, Balanchine was very hands-on with everything. Lighting, casting, camera angles, um, very, very um, concerned. And then he's on record saying on a voiceover that he knows when he dies, different people will be dancing his ballets, different people will be rehearsing his ballets. He says, oh, they'll still be my ballets, but they'll be different. And he wanted a record and he said I want a record of how my ballets looked by people I trained and rehearsed by me. So Balanchine did care about his ballets. Now I'm kind of stuck in the middle here because in one way my constant harping on preserving his ballets correctly he didn't really care about so maybe I shouldn't do that. But the other side of me remembers how much he did care about his ballets being performed correctly. And now where does that leave New York City Ballet in all this? Now Balanchine didn't leave any ballets to New York City Ballet in the will, purposely. Um, they actually tried to break the will, saying that all the ballets were choreographed while he was employed by the New York City Ballet, therefore they were the property of the New York City Ballet. But luckily Barbara Horgan, who was the executive as will, fought for it and she did Balanchine's wishes that his ballets would be owned by various wives and various mostly women that he uh, adored and that he choreographed for. So the ballets have been under the control basically of the, of the various people that he left them to in the will, um, coordinated through the Balanchine Trust contracts, etc., etc. Um, since I care for the New York City Ballet so much as an institution, uh, I was hoping that they would um, really be concerned about keeping their um, pride of place, as it were, as being the uh, Balanchine company as they go forward with Justin Peck and all the other choreographers. And as I've said over and over, uh, there's a lot of great new choreography done for the company, which is great. I have no, why not? Um, wonderful dancers in the company. Um, technically, most of them are better than my generation. Uh, but the way ballets have traditionally been handed down is from one dancer to another. And Peter Martins, alone in the world of ballet, decided to make a break with that tradition. And I can get into that on another post. I don't want this one to be that long. But Peter purposely um, did not want dancers, including Violet Verdi, Suzanne Farrell, even though they were on staff, he did not want them to really rehearse the ballets. And I know this for a fact because a couple holdovers from Balanchine's time, Victor Castelli who was a young dancer that Balanchine really liked and Balanchine cast him in Prodigal Son, the poet in La Sonambula, and many other roles. Uh, Victor was a very close friend of mine, about 10 years younger than I am and so I was I was teaching Victor at the school when he was 15 years old and so he joined the company and I was so glad that Balanchine took an interest in him wild wacky character but a beautiful dancer very artistic poetic huge technique you can see him in Mozartiana he does the jig in Mozartiana um, but when Victor and a few other people started rehearsing the ballets after Balanchine's death Peter Martins took them out of their rehearsals which caused them no end of uh, concern. Suzanne Farrell was very upset. Everybody was very um, hurt. Uh, some of them started drinking too much, uh, but it was Peter's company and he could do what he want, wanted. And um, 
there you have it. So there was a whole 30 year period where what should have been happening with dancers like McBride and Allegra Kent and Melissa Hayden and Violet and Suzanne Farrell and Mimi Paul and Jacques D'Amboise and Edward Villela um, should have been handing down their roles to the new generation. That was all stopped. Now it may be coming back. There's some signs that the new direction uh, right now, Jonathan Stafford and the others, Rebecca Crone, et cetera, Justin Peck, et cetera, um, have been inviting a few of the older dancers to come back and coach, but <laughs> that's not really gonna solve the problem because they're not in the theater full time. Uh, their coaching may be forgotten in a day, you know, but that's a risk the company has decided to take. But I just wanted to you know, mention this about Balanchine's legacy. On one hand, he said, who cares? He didn't care, to hell with it. Didn't leave any ballets to the board. Life goes on, the company will change and go on, nobody cares. Hmm. That's one side of it. The other side of it was all the care he took in the filming of his ballets, especially near the end of his life. And even though you're not gonna have, and you shouldn't have, and you don't wanna have, carbon copies of the way these dancers did the ballets, I don't see what's wrong with having them give their input to the new dancers taking over these roles. That's my opinion. Uh, not to say to the dancer, you have to dance it down to your little finger and to your eyebrow the way I danced it. However, this is how Balanchine wanted it and he had some certain phrases that he would use and he was very good about giving um, non-dance illustrations to get the effect he wanted. And I know this because I had Melissa Hayden and Viola Verdi out to my company in Los Angeles a lot and worked with Allegra Kent and they would say, oh, Mr. B said this, and he wanted this, and he did this, and it all made the ballets come alive when my young dancers did it the way uh, they were suggested by the older generation. So that's what I was hoping for the New York City Ballet. So I hope this has um, been an interesting short little chat. Um, I think I've made my point. Uh, legacy, it's only important if you want it to be important. And I will finish this up with a little clip from Balanchine presenting the New York City Ballet as it looked in 1965, I think it is, at a uh, perf uh, video film performance that he did in Montreal. And you can see the grace, the elegance, the class of Balanchine himself and the dancers um, of that period. And it's another world, it's another time, and I understand things aren't like that today, but. It's really charming, so I hope you enjoy that. And Clifford out. Bye.